It was their first massive hit in America in 1986. In Excess rocketed all the way to the top five with What You Need from their U.S. breakthrough album, Listen Like Thieves. Andrew Ferris, the co-founder and co-writer of In Excess, tells the story of writing it with Michael Hutchins and the day he met a member of The Doors, next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. We interview the great artists of the rock and roll era, and it's a mystery every single day, so make sure to subscribe right now. Click the bell so you never miss out. Also, don't forget to check out our exclusive content behind the scenes on Patreon. I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, where featured artists, they go deep on their greatest songs, and I'm excited and honored to bring you another episode of Revelations with Andrew Ferris, the legendary co-writer of In Excess's biggest hits uh, with lead singer Michael Hutchins. Now, before In Excess stormed the world with the blockbuster kick... They broke through on the U.S. charts with What You Need. It hit number five on the Hot 100, number three on the rock charts, number 21 in Canada, and number two in their native Australia. He talks about creating this song with Michael, Michael Hutchins, and also meeting a member of The Doors and what the member of The Doors said to him about their lead singer. It's a can't-miss interview. As we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, my favorite frames ever. Go design your own pair with digital blue light protection at zenny.com. Here's the story of what you need. But jumping into 85, Listen Like Thieves, Chris Thomas produced there. That went to number one in Australia, number 11 in the U.S. That was a breakthrough, that album, especially here in America. (laughs) What You Need was a massive song, and that was... The lead single in Australia and New Zealand, but this time was the lead single in U.S. and Europe. It was kind of almost like the setup track for What You Need. Although, this time is one of my favorite In Excess songs ever. I love that. You wrote that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I wrote that one on my own. And, uh, you know, I always have been able to write songs on my own, but I like writing with other people because I, I think you get you know, like the great songwriting partnerships, something really magical happens when you share your art with somebody else. Something just clicks, you know, and you get this beautiful duality in the sound of the writing where you can tell that there's something else going on the whole time in it. Um, And have someone pull you up and say, I think that sucks. Or I think that's great if you think it sucks, you know, and that's important too. You know, you've got a kind of reality check with it. That's important. But what You Need, yeah, What You Need was a very special moment because we tracked, including this time and all the rest of the Listen Like Thieves, we'd virtually finished the album with Chris Thomas. And it was exciting because we knew we had a good album. And Chris came out one one day after we'd all had dinner, at the end of a part of one of the sessions when we were recording Listen Like Thieves. He said, um, you've got a very good album here. I like it. He goes, um, but I think you need one more song, you know? And we looked at each other and we're like, Mark and I are like, "Uh uh-oh. And then we're like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, just think you need something else, you know. You've got a great album, but it's just something else you need, you know. So he goes, I'll tell you what, you two, (laughs) he says to me, Michael, you go in that room, okay, we're all going to come back here about this time tomorrow and we want to hear a great song. And they all left. I'm like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, great, you know. (laughs) know? Oh, no pressure, you know. No, you know, but that talking about pressure, because this will go somewhere where where I'm going to say it was good for us because, and it was my brother, Tim, who said, you know, what? I've heard this riff thing that Andrew's got, you know, and that groove, that he goes, he's got a piece of music with that stuff all over it. Why don't you start there? And so we did. And that's what we worked off that groove. And um, I remember working on the groove originally with Michael, actually, the two of us. And I, I'm going to con- contradict what I said before. We actually worked up that groove together, which we didn't normally do. And that that sort of, and that funky groove, that, that kind of smooth, loopy kind of groove. Mm-hmm. 
not many people were doing that in 1985. I got to tell you, you know, there wasn't a lot of that going on, you know, and um, at least not that we heard. And that was the other thing that we wanted to do was to mix rock, you know, kind of like walk this way, the way that, you know, Aerosmith did it with Run DMC. You told me to It's kind of what we were trying to do then was that idea of having the big slamming guitars. With a funky groove, you know, so it just it just won't leave you alone. You're like, yep, there it is. <laughs> you know, it's gonna knock on your door. Uh, and that and that was where we went with the song. And yeah, we we had a top five hit, I think, in the US with it. It was it went massive all around the world. We and the video we shot for it's got a kind of funny story. If I can just say this, is that um, uh, we were trying to think of a different video idea. So uh, Richard Lowenstein came out with this idea, which was absolutely brilliant. Uh, you know, and, and and of shooting, and I'll come to this in a minute. Mick Jagger called Michael and said, "I just watched your video for what you need." He goes. How did you make that video? Because the technology didn't exist with computers back then, right? There was no, there was no such technology. And then Michael said, "You really want to know?" He's like, "Yeah, man, I want to know. How did you make the video?" You know, and it was because well, what we did was we shot it on a motor drive, on a stills camera, right? And then with a sixteen mil uh, film camera running in the background, which was the main part of the video, but the still motor drive section it was then the negatives were hand colored and then sequenced together right? and it cost like we took it down to what we call a local chemist in australia or drugstore or whatever and they used to develop your photographs right so we made our video for like 200 bucks <laughs> and everyone's spending half a million dollars on a video we're like no nah, 200 bucks there's your video you know when you gotta walk now, that's a funny thing. It was a massive video, you know. Um, yeah, you know, and um, we, we, I think we were up for an MTV award, which we got later on for Kick. But the best thing about the best thing about this experience, I was saying about writing what you need and that pressure that Chris Thomas put Michael and I under, was very good for us because when we had a top five hit like that around the world and it went really big, went huge, is that. I remember our manager at the time, Chris Murphy, called me at home and he said, aren't you excited that, you know, your song's gone number one all over the place and it's top five wherever, you know. And I said, yeah, I, but there was something strange about it that bothered me and I couldn't think about what it was. And uh, I said, yeah, that's great. And I hung up the phone. And then I remember walking around about an hour later and I realized what was bothering me about it was I realized, I thought, okay, when we go to write the next bunch of songs, is that the pressure we just put ourselves under? In other words, is that the best thing we're ever going to write? And that'll be the what we did, and that was the end of our career. Do you see what I mean? You know, yeah. And that, and I'm sure that's been through other people's minds before in their careers, where you go, "What's next?" You know. And I and I was weird because I called Michael up and I said, "How how are you feeling about this?" You know. And he said, "I I'm," and he said exactly what I just said to you then. And I said, I know, I'm feeling exactly the same way. It's really weird. You know, like I, I'm very uncomfortable about it, whereas I should be really excited about it, you know. And I said, we have to kick some ass when we, you know, literally when we go to write the next bunch of songs. And he said, I know, this is really putting us into a lot of pressure. And I said, yeah, man, it sure is. And so when Kick rolled around, and I didn't mean to segue into this unless you don't want to, you know, but when Kick rolled around, that's where we set ourselves up right from the beginning was let's approach it like what you need. Let's let's go into this thing and just every single song could be a single, like everything that we do and write. Yeah, everything. As we move on from what you need, I think it's cool that it was called Funk Song Number 13 is what I read. Is that right? <laughs> it was something either 13 or 9. I can't remember anymore. We gave them different numbers, you know, just, yeah, number 9 or number 13 or whatever it was, you know. We don't know what it's called yet, but that's what we're going to call it. Yeah. So, well, what do you remember about recording it? Because that's such a funky song. Like you said, that guitar with the, again, your signature guitar line that you always come up with. It's so memorable. Yeah. 
yeah. and then Michael, of course, bringing the vocal that he brings to that. Yeah. It's just like burning the place down, man. Yeah, no, Michael's vocal was killer too, and the and the lyric is so deceptively simple, but what a great message, you know? Forget about your troubles in life, you know? Don't you know life's not easy? So what you need, what you need is to have a great time. You know, what's so complicated, you know? I mean, I watch interviews with you guys. I mean, with YouTube, you can find anything. But what's cool is these interviews with the two of you, you could see, like you talked about, your engineer mind. You can see it's working with the way you're talking about music and the way he's talking about music. And, of course, we all know those people that are just, they're just blessed with charisma. I mean, just Michael just had it. I agree. You can't put yep. your finger on it. He just has that. And that's what's great is that partnership. And it's, it's a partnership that, to me, you guys really were like one of the Lennon McCartney's of my time because that songwriting partnership brought so many hits, so many songs that, and I know I speak for a lot of people here, that mean so much. It's funny because we had this channel up and going for a while and people are always saying, when are you going to do something on NXS? <laughs> because it's such a part of not only your childhood, but teenage years. That's what's cool about a band. When a certain band and you find them and you grow and the brand grow, you grow up with that band from the time that you're eight or nine years old to the point where you're in your 20s or 30s. And it's cool because these songs are the checkpoints of the things that happen in your life. So they feel like a friend. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Same for me. Yeah. And to be able to be that for other people is pretty cool. Band name. There's always been the urban legend about a member of Midnight Oil and come up with that. So set the record straight. What's the true story on that one? With, oh, with the name of the band? With NXS, yeah. Because you yeah, had we, called the Vegetables for a while, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, you know, I or we wrote a song called We Are the Vegetables. And that kind of silly song, but anyway. Uh, but it was really, uh, we were doing, Midnight Oil had kind of already broken pretty big. And they liked us and they put us on the bill with them. And so we would go around playing all these pretty rough pubs, actually, with Minato. It was, a, it was, a, I won't, I won't pull any punches here. It was a tough environment in those years. Like ACDC came out of that. And you did have to be a bit gritty to get it through all that. It wasn't really, it wasn't the teeny pop thing. It wasn't that at all. It was kind of rough, you know. And then amongst all that, the road crews were awesome as they always have been, but the guys who you know do the hard labor when you when you're you know when you're not playing or before you play or whatever and it was one of the road crew guys from the oils um that have been working for them goes i have this idea for uh, for a name of a band we're like that's very cool we all looked at each other and it was like and also you gotta imagine you talked about michael and his chari natural charisma and i agreed totally with that but also for michael the name of our band at that point was the farris brothers you know and I think from Michael, he was like, the, the witch, you know, as far as, you know, it's not about him, you know, right? You know, yeah. You know, so and I think he, so we all thought about it, went, hmm. And also the brothers thing, I guess back then, late 70s, you might have had the Doobie brothers or the, you know, the Johnson brothers or whoever the brothers were back then, but, you know, Everly brothers. By that time, the brothers thing wasn't cool, really, you know going into right into the early 80s the, can we just not do the brothers thing please you know <laughs> yeah. um, it's come it's come back around again it's cool again now it wasn't back then you know but anyway um and i'm glad it's cool again <laughs> what's wrong with brothers anyway right you know sisters <laughs> what way anyway so yeah look I, I think how it really came together there was just we we liked the name and it just suited us instantly we just attached ourselves to it it attached ourselves to us and it was like another jigsaw piece that fell into place for us you know and we became that thing whatever that is you know but when you're asking me more making the observation before about my more kind of i suppose engineering technical mind about things and then with michael's just you know uh, oozing his uh, charismatic sort of 
personality, nature, talent, you know, that's where we were in like the odd couple in that sense. You know, we weren't similar people competing on the same level. Um, I have a sense of humour about charisma. I think I'm fantastically charismatic, but, <laughs> but you know, but not, in the, but not in the way he was, you know. And so I would try to, you know, put my charisma in one area and let him do his thing. And many years later, we actually talked about that really right towards the end of his life. Uh, it was good. You know, he, he apologized to me, actually. Uh, and he said, you know, to be honest with you, and really after kind of listen, listen Like Thieves and after the success of Kick and all that stuff we went on, you know, and, uh, and X and all that period, I don't care what anyone says, that kind of fame and success, it messes with your head, you know. It doesn't matter who you are, you know. Anyone that says it doesn't, I don't believe them. Anyway, so well, there's a front man in a band, and then there's a front man in a band. And the thing is, is that Michael was, I mean, he's Jim Morrison for my generation, right? I could name 50 bands from the 80s that were huge bands and had big songs, they had great singers and everything, but they weren't Michael Hutchins. I mean, this is a guy that not only had the voice and the look, but like you said, demigod. But he was the Jim Morrison of the 80s. And I, I hate even saying Jim Morrison because he was his own person. He was something completely different. I got a connection with that, a real one as well, where not so much with Jim Morrison, but um, in excess, we played a show uh, in Los Angeles called Rock and Roll Tonight. And the other acts on were Eric Clapton and uh, Simple Minds. And, uh, and it was pretty nerve-wracking for us because this was our first public performance on US television, uh, you know, and it was really early when we first turned up. And we played well. We were a little little too enthusiastic, I think, when I look back on it, but that was the way it was anyway. But at the end of the performance we did, and we played well, I think, and then uh, Ray Manzarek came backstage, right? And he said, I was sitting at home and I saw you guys come on the television. And I got to tell you, I've never seen anyone besides your lead singer that reminded me so much of Jim. That's what he said to me. And I said, well, I, I am staying there gobsmacked because Ray Manzarak's talking to me at all, right, you know? And then, then I said, well, if you want to talk to Michael, he's right over there, you know? So he said, yeah, man, he walked over and he, and, I, and then I was like, holy shit, that's Ray Manzarak, you know, when he, when he walks over here, you know? when he walks over the other side of the room. Um, but, um, you know, it was, I, I really felt that, well, first of all, television in the U.S. is very important for our band. I think without that exposure that we'd had on TV and MTV and that, I think radio never really knew what to make of our band really until later on, you know. They were really, we really confused everyone because we weren't British. You know, we weren't typically what people expected of a band, you know, we weren't typical anything, you know. Because your music was all over the place. It was funk, yeah. it was rock, yep. it was yep. modern rock, alternative, new wave. I mean, mm. everybody wanted a piece. You're one of those bands that every kind of format claimed in a way at different mm. times. But what was cool about what you said earlier is very true, is that when you were a young man and listening to radio, every it wasn't these formats that you could play Stevie Wonder, and then the next song could be Zeppelin or whatever. And right. I do think that the young generation is like that right now. I don't think that they listen to music the way we do, like where it's punk or it's new wave or it's soul. I think that from what I've seen, these young kids, that's how they like to listen to this classic music. They can listen to hip hop and then rock and roll and then pop and stuff like that. So it's kind of interesting how it's coming back around. Well, I, I agree with that. And I think it's healthy in a way too. I mean, you know, music's a very broad landscape, um, you know, or a soundscape and, you know, you're allowed, you know, there's really, and that was one of the things I first realized as a songwriter, which is my main thing I've really done in my life is that, um, you know, that and raise a family. I was going to say that uh, I think, you know, from a career point of view, I think, that 
you know, writing and everything of music is very good that you have a broad idea of other people's music and that idea of other people's music and that you, you're prepared to be open-minded about different styles because it'll help you, you know, when you go to write. Eventually, it doesn't seem like it at the time, but those influences begin to come out in your writing. And, and just as you said, if, if a young person is listening to two or three different genres of music, then if you're a writer that's able to, 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 to go across those different genres and, and push buttons with people, you're going to have a lot more chance of being successful. This is a song that's been in pop culture for a long time. I mean, Weird Al at the time covered it in his polka party song. <laughs> at that point, if Weird Al covers you, like it's, it's over. Yeah, the stamp of parody. What did you think about that? Did you even were you aware at the time that he'd done that? No, I wasn't actually. But I, I feel I know what you mean when when you reach that level. And I, I, I have to say that's something in life I didn't see coming. With all of this, you know, success we were chasing and lucky to have achieved, you know, as a group of people. What I didn't see coming was your enter into culture in people's lives. You, when you start this thing. You know, if you're a songwriter, an entertainer or a musician or whatever, you know, it can go, it can start off in all kinds of ways. It can be just, you know, passion. You love music. You like writing. You like money. You, I don't know, whatever it is you're looking for in your life, you know, to put the pieces together for, that you're looking for. But what you don't see coming, if you really get what you want and you get more successful and you get famous, is you enter into culture. People go, well, you're a part of my life you know, or, or your music is, or and you're branded like that as you go into it. And that's a strange thing, you know. As, as I've gotten older, I actually get quite emotional about it. That's the part of it that I, I most appreciate is that people have uh, taken you into their home, their heart, their mind, and appreciated your art or your work or your thoughts or your thinking. And that's quite an emotional subject for me because I don't take that stuff lightly. That's not an ego thing at all. That's a whole other deal. When it enters into movies and TV shows and video mm. games, I mean, that's like taking something that's already a big part of culture, music, and then putting it with another big part of culture, which is movies or video games. And it's like a double whammy for you because it also introduces you to a new generation. I mean, my, I remember hearing this on Miami Vice as a kid because I love the show and I love the band, and the two come together. You guys got a favorite TV soundtrack you want to hear? music is but then like coronation street this is the british drama and then movies it was in monster and hot tub time machine take me home tonight What did you think when you heard some of those uses? Well, I like Top Top Time Machine. It was a funny movie for start. Um, yeah, you know, like uh, there's a lot of things I, I think about in the passage of time and the uh, tyranny of, of time has gone by and will continue to go by. Uh, you know, sometimes I just, I think I get a little sad when I think about Michael's, you know, demise and, and all of that. And I think, you know, it's a shame he couldn't, see some of the lighter side of life with some of the things we've you know what I mean like a, you know the, 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 the period that, that, that he passed away and for him was so personally tumultuous and, 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 and rigorously emotional as a person you know and difficult that he was facing his own demons or whatever um, you know but there's another side to it all that has been a wonderful fantastic happy beyond belief enjoyable experience hey thanks so much for watching leave us a comment about in excess and this amazing song from 1986 what are your thoughts and memories on this great band make sure to subscribe to join our great community i'd love to hear from everybody to get more content click on our patreon links and to get in excess merch and their music look at our amazon links below help us keep the music alive until next time Three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe.